Well, I was thinking about speaking on something else. I thought, no, I need to speak on uh, the history of Israel to give you a background of what's going on over there. And uh, there are groups that are demonstrating on college campuses. Uh, from get rid of all of Israel from the river to the sea, you know, the, the Jordan River to the sea. It's like, okay, that's all of Israel. You want to wipe them out? It's like, where did this group come from? So to answer that, I want to give some background. Um, the uh, Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites have been in that area from 1800 B.C. with Abraham. <clears throat> from 1400 B.C., Joshua coming into the Promised Land. 1000 B.C. is when David captures Jerusalem, and, and then the ten northern tribes of Israel are taken captive by Assyria in 722 B.C., and they are scattered around. And then Judah is taken captive by Babylon in 587 B.C., and then Cyrus of Persia lets them go back in 539 B.C. They get back, and there is a priest named Ezra, and he says, we learned our lesson. We're not going to get into idols anymore. We're going to teach the law. And he would build platforms and the priests would teach the law. And so the word Pharisee means student of the law. And out of all the planet Earth, they were worshiping God the closest to how God wanted to be worshiped. But over the years, they added on a little extra here, a little extra there, a lot of traditions. And so when Jesus showed up, they didn't recognize him because they piled on so many extra things. But Persia was conquered by Alexander the Great, and he brings Greek stuff, right? The Greek language, Greek culture, and the Greeks were into naked statues and naked gymnasiums and a lot of immorality. And the Greeks now were the ruling power uh, Alexander the Great dies, his uh, four generals take the area and divide it up, and the Seleucids get Persia, and there's this Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's a Greek leader, and he's the one that Hanukkah was, uh, he was making them sacrifice pigs and, des and desecrate the temple, and the Jews drive him out. And, um, but uh, the Greeks, because they were the political power, the Sadducees, were political Jews that wanted to butter up to the Greeks. And so the Sadducees looked at the Pharisees as sort of backwards. So the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, did not believe in angels, did not believe in miracles, did not believe in any of that stuff. They were just more or less political Jews. And they were buttering up. And it turns into a war. So the Jews get a king, they drive off the Syrians and, and the, the Greeks, and they get to run themselves for a century. It's called the Hasmonean dynasty. And the Jews have their own kingdom, but inside you have Pharisees and Sadducees, and they start a war. And they're killing each other, and word gets to Pompey. He is a Roman general, 63 BC. He's up near the Black Sea, Cappadocia. And he's doing his Roman conquering stuff, and somebody brings him a message. Judah is having a civil war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And Pompey's like, perfect time to invade. One of the things you study when you read a lot of history is that if you can get a nation fighting against itself on the inside, it's easier to conquer them from the outside. Karl Marx even gave a term for it called critical theory. You study a country and identify all the groups, ethnically, Bosnians, Croats, Serbs, economically, proletariat, the bourgeois, uh, religiously, Sunni, Shia, Orthodox, and you call some victims, others oppressors, haves and have-nots, and you stir them up to protest and riot and fight each other, and then when they weaken each other, then you can come in and conquer both really easily. Um, but, so Pompey goes, he invades, he takes over, and from that point on, Judah is a Roman province. Now, Pompey did go into Jerusalem, he did go into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and he saw the magnificence of it, and he turns around and tells his men, don't touch this building. And so the Jews sort of liked Pompey because he protected their temple. Um, uh, then you have uh, Herod, and he's uh, the king, but he's underneath of the Romans, and then the Roman, uh, you know, Augustus Caesar wanted to have a census, and Anyway, so uh, Jesus' ministry is 30 to 33. 
Jesus is crucified and Jesus rises from the dead. Everybody say, thank God, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Jesus rose from the dead. And then the day of Pentecost, the Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit and they go off around the world. And I found this video that tracks the spread of Christianity. So the red is the Roman Empire and white is Christianity. is Islam. And then blue is the Mongolian Genghis Khan. is communism. So Christianity is the largest religion in the world, about a third. Islam is the second largest religion in the world, about a quarter. So as Christianity was growing, it was immediately persecuted. The church was born into a one-world anti-Christian government, the Roman Empire. I don't know about you, but if I was going to start a movement, I'd say give them a couple of years to get their feet on the ground. No, immediately the church was persecuted. And we're moving in the direction of a government persecuting Christians. Well, the church was born into that. And uh, eventually the Christians overthrew the, the, uh, the empire. So you had Nero. He sets fire to Rome, blames the Christians. Here are these innocent Christians, and they get blamed for burning Rome. There's an insurrection. They blame them. Anyway, um, then Nero sends Vespian to attack Judea. 66 AD. And then Nero dies. And so Vespian leaves and goes back to be the next emperor, and he sends his son Titus over to pick up where he left off. And so for about two years, the Jews could have got their defense going, but they divided themselves into several different groups inside of the city of Jerusalem. They had it walled off, and they're fighting each other. And so Rome comes, they're all divided, and Rome conquers Jerusalem, takes them captive. All the treasures from the temple are brought back to Rome, Titus, the Arch of Titus, and they use the, the wealth to build the Colosseum. And, but whenever a country does something bad against Israel, it sort of seems like shortly thereafter something bad happens to that country. So in 79 AD, the Mount Vesuvius blows up and wipes out a huge area of Rome. I went there in college, and you can still see these uh, bodies covered with ash. And, um, but one of the periods I want to get to is Hadrian. And he has faced, faced the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt. So Hadrian's male lover dies in the river, Nile River. They're on a love boat cruise, and he dies. And so after that, Hadrian's sort of not a nice guy. And so he decides he wants to stop these Jews who are trying to uh, have their revolt, and he sends a Roman legion there. The Jews wipe out an entire Roman legion. Hadrian sends another Roman legion there. They get wiped out. He sends another Roman legion there, and they disappear. It's like, well, send a message. Up there. Well, I can't find them. They're gone. He sends the entire Roman army, all of the Roman legions, thousands and thousands, and they go city to city to city, wipe out every city in Judah. And they kill and pillage and destroy, and he decides that it's this religion that keeps causing these Jews to want to rebel, so he says, I'm going to cut it off at the head, I'm going to get rid of their religion. He kills all the Jewish scholars, all the rabbis. He burns the Torah, every copy he can find. He prohibits the Jewish calendar. He hunts down and kills every descendant of David. 
Now, Jesus was the descendant of David. That's the Messiah. And thank God for Jesus. But the ones that didn't accept Jesus, they kept looking for a descendant of David to be the Messiah. And Hadrian says, you know what? I'm going to make sure there's no more revolts because I'm going to kill every descendant of David. And then Hadrian builds a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. And then Hadrian renames Jerusalem Aelia Capitolina. Aelia is Hadrian's family name. And then Hadrian renames Judea Syria, Palestina. So from that moment on, on the map, instead of saying Judea, it says Palestine. That's where the word Palestine came from. I'm skipping past some history. You got the Byzantine Empire for a while, but then Islam comes along with Muhammad. 632 AD is when he dies. And then the Muslims conquer Arabia, conquer Yemen, conquer Jerusalem, which had been a Byzantine Christian city since Constantine. The Muslims conquer Syria, which had been a Christian country since the Apostle Paul. Muslims conquer Egypt, which was evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel. There used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. They're wiped out by the Muslims. They invade Spain. And then they conquer into Turkey. So all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. Ephesus, Colossus, you know, Thyatira, Sardis, and, and then you have the Turkish Ottoman Empire. For about 700 years, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, and he's surrounding Vienna, Austria. And, but the Turkish Ottoman Empire began to run out of money. Now, they didn't force the Christians to become Muslims. Why? Because the Christians paid the taxes. They would take away all the arms, all the weapons, so they couldn't fight back, and they would make them ransom their life once a year, called the jizya tax. And if you ran out of money and you couldn't pay the tax, they could tell you, take you and your wife and kids and sell you into slavery. But as the centuries went on, there were fewer Christians, right? Because they were getting oppressed, and they would leave or die or, or convert. And so the Ottoman Empire in the late 1800s was called the sick man of Europe. And uh, Mark Twain visited, and he went to Jerusalem, and he said, Palestine is desolate, unlovely rags, wretchedness, poverty, dirt, those signs and symbols that indicate the presence of Muslim rule. Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, lifeless. I would not desire to live there. Muslims watch the Golden Gate with a jealous eye and an anxious one, for they have an honored tradition that when it falls, Islamism will fall, and with it, the Ottoman Empire. Mark Twain says, renowned renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur. The wonderful temple, which was the pride and the glory of Israel, is gone, and the Ottoman crescent is lifted above the spot where, on that most memorable day in the annals of the world, they reared the Holy Cross. So the European powers are now beginning to take some of the old Ottoman Empire. France takes Algeria. Italy takes Libya. Britain takes uh, Egypt and Khartoum and uh, Sudan. Russia takes a little piece. And what's left of the Ottoman Empire is weakened. Abdul Hamid II has 13 wives and a bunch of concubines. And Armenia wants to break away too. And he says, no more countries breaking away. And he kills hundreds of thousands of Armenian Christians. And, um, but the European powers are taking parts of the Ottoman Empire. Now, side note, where did oil come from in the 1800s? Whales. <laughs> they went Moby Dick, right? They'd chase these whales around the world for their blubber, their fat, and they would boil it, melt it down, and put it in these whale oil lamps. And they're chasing these poor whales to extinction, but they're saved by oil coming out of the ground. The whales are saved by oil coming out of the ground. Isn't that interesting? 1859, Drake oil well, then Oklahoma, and then Baghdad, Kirkuk, the Ottoman Empire. And meanwhile, Winston Churchill changes the British Navy from coal to oil. But there's only one oil well in all of Britain. It's in the Sherwood Forest, of all places. <laughs> and, um, and so Britain needs oil, and so they make a treaty with Iran. Persia. So the two big Muslim countries are the Ottoman Empire and Persia. And so Britain teams up with Persia and they start a company called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. You know it better as BP, right? British Petroleum. Here they are taking down the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company sign, putting up the B British Petroleum sign. Well, Germany is industrializing, but it has no oil wells. So it makes a treaty with the Ottoman Empire, the Berlin-Baghdad Railroad, so here's a picture of Sultan 
Abdul Hamid II and Kaiser Wilhelm II. A movie Christian Bale did uh, called The Promise documents this period of the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe, and they had a little tolerance going on with the Armenian minorities, and, but then the Germans come and say, we will give you rifles if you give us oil. And the Germans whip the Turks into this jihad frenzy. So half of World War I took place in the Middle East. And uh, Woodrow Wilson tries to get us to rescue the Armenians because they're doing another butchery of the Armenians uh, called the, uh, the Young Turks and the Arch Murderers. And, and so uh, World War I ends. And the map of Europe is redrawn. Well, guess what? Since Germany had teamed up with the Ottoman Empire, the map of the Ottoman Empire is redrawn. And you got these European powers deciding who's going to get what. France is going to take Syria and Lebanon. Russia's going to take a little piece, right? Uh, you have Britain taking you know, the whole Middle East and parts of Egypt. Now, one important piece of the puzzle is during World War I, the British were running out of explosives. And a Jew from Russia, right? Fiddler on the roof, Jews leaving Russia. Well, one of those Jews named Chaim Wiseman went to Britain. He's a chemist. And he finds a way to make acetone, a solvent needed to make explosives. He finds a way to make it from a bacterial fermentation process. They take breweries and turn them into making acetone. And after the war, the British are thankful that he helped them have enough explosives. And so they want to make him a knight or a sir and give him some, you know, an estate. And he says, you know, uh, I would really like a homeland for the Jewish people. And so they issue the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And they give the Jews what used to be part of the old Ottoman Empire. There's uh, Lord Balfour, His Majesty's government view would favor the establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people. Um, now here is a Jewish author, Jeffrey Alderman, Jewish Chronicle, 2012. The Balfour Declaration was born out of religious sentiment. Arthur Balfour was a Christian mystic who believed that the Almighty had chosen him to be an instrument of the divine will, the purpose of which was to restore the Jews to their ancient homeland, perhaps as a precursor to the second coming of the Messiah. The declaration, the Balfour Declaration, was thus intended to assist in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. This appealed to Prime Minister Lloyd George, believing in the prophecies of the Bible, which he knew inside and out. The idea of the Jews going back came from Christians during the Second Great Awakening Revival. So First Great Awakening, George Whitfield, but early 1800s, you had the Second Great Awakening Revival, right? Camp meetings and uh, preachers and so forth. And people were discovering these prophecies that Jesus is going to come back and rule and reign for a thousand years, so they called them millennialists. But they saw that in order for these prophecies to be fulfilled, the, the Jews are supposed to be back in the Holy Land. So it was Christians that would go to the Jewish synagogues and say, you guys need to think about going back there. Here is another book written by Anita Shapira, Israel a History, published 2014. The idea of the Jews returning to their ancient homeland as the first step to world redemption seems to have originated among a specific group of evangelical English Protestants that flourished in England in the 1840s. They passed this notion onto Jewish circles. Right? So why is there a connection between evangelical Christians and Israel? Because we helped bring it into existence. We came up with the idea, and from that point on, you have Christians saying, hey, right, we want to support them. And that's why I love your pastor so much, going over there saying, we support you. And, um, and so a Jew named Theodore Herzl organizes the first Zionist Congress. It's like, let's actually try to make this thing happen. And on their own, they were buying land over there and immigrating over there while it was still part of the Ottoman Empire. And they have this Congress in Switzerland, and at it is Henry Dunant, the founder of the International Red Cross. And he is the first recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And he, so whenever you see the Red Cross, the founder of the Red Cross supported Israel going back to its homeland. And here's Lord Balfour said, my personal hope is that the Jews will make good in Palestine and eventually found a Jewish state. It is up to them now. We've given them their great opportunity. And uh, Lord Balfour, his painting was de defaced last month. <laughs> Activist slashes painting of British author of Jewish homeland declaration. 
Well, the land that was given to the Jews was the exact boundaries that God had promised Moses. And um, somebody threw a monkey wrench in the works, Lawrence of Arabia. Who was he? He was a lieutenant in the British Army, stationed in Cairo, sent on a fact-checking, fact-finding assignment. Hey, go down and meet with the Arab Muslims to see if they're going to be willing to join the British, fight the Turkish Muslims. We've got two different kinds of Muslims. Arab Muslims, Turkish Muslims. We've got this Ottoman Turkish Empire. And so he, he's basically doing critical race theory. He's, he's going in there saying, hey, I want to do, sow division in the Ottoman Empire. This, there's this group within the Ottoman Empire called the Arabs, and they really don't like that. And so, hey, help us defeat the Turks. And Lawrence of Arabia does something. Instead of just reporting back, he promises the Arabs that if they help the British, they will get all the land in the Middle East. And he admitted that he was lying to them. He writes in Seven Pillars of Wisdom, 1922, had I been an honest advisor to the Arabs, I would have advised them to go home and not risk their lives fighting for such stuff. I I risked the fraud on my conviction that Arab help was necessary to our cheap and speedy victory in the East, and better we win and break our word than lose. For being a successful trickster, And to prevent this unpleasantness arising, I began in my reports to conceal the true stories of things. He admitted he lied to the Arabs, but why is this important? Because the Arabs believed him. And so now we have a problem. The same land is promised to two different groups. You have this land that used to be part of the Ottoman Empire promised to the Jews because of Arthur Balfour and Chaim Wiseman and the acetone. And the same piece of land is promised to these Arabs because of this unauthorized Lawrence of Arabia going down there. And um, so let's look at the Arabs. The main Arab is Hussein ibn Ali al-Hashimi. We'll just shorten his name to al-Hashimi. He's the Sharif and Emir of Mecca. So he is in charge of all of the Muslim holy places in Mecca. He is from a family called the Hashemites, which is the same family that Muhammad was from. And so he had oversight. And since Muslims were coming from around the world in their Hajj, one of the five pillars of Islam, once in your life you're supposed to make a pilgrimage to Mecca, he's in charge of Mecca. These Muslims were coming from Indonesia and all around the world, and he was a let's get along type of guy. He's called a modernist. And he said, let's get along with the Jews. And while we're at it, let's get along with the Armenians. Let's get along with the Christians. Let's get along with the British. He was actually a a fairly nice guy. And um, this is what he wrote during the Armenian genocide. He writes, protect and take care of everyone from the Jacobite Armenian community living in your territories. Defend them as you would defend yourselves. They are protected people of the Muslims. Well, the British... Not only do they give that land to the Jews, the land right above Israel, they create a brand new country called Iraq. Used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, now it's a brand new country called Iraq. And they sort of follow through on Lawrence of Arabia's promise. They take the son of al-Hashimi, named Fazl, and they make him king of Iraq. But Fazl thought he was supposed to be king over Syria and Iraq. He thought that because of Lawrence of Arabia's promise that he was going to get it all. Well, um, now Fazl played in the movie Lawrence of Arabia is played by the actor Alec Guinness. And you know Alec Guinness because he was Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. Anyway, (laughs) so here is the picture of Chaim Wiseman with Fazl. So here's the Jewish guy with the the Arab Muslim Fazl, and they were actually getting along. And so here's Fazl. He writes this in 1990. We feel that the Arabs and the Jews are cousins, and having suffered similar oppression at the hands of powers stronger than themselves, we look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. And then his dad, the Sharif of Mecca, al-Hashimi, he writes... The resources of the country are still virgin soil and will be developed by the Jewish immigrants. That the country is for its original sons, calls them the original sons, for all their differences, a sacred and beloved homeland. And uh, so now 
France was given a protectorate over Syria. And it's like the U.S. was protected over the Philippines, right? But France took it another step. Instead of viewing itself as a protectorate, France comes in and drives out Fazel and his army and everybody. And France is pretty tough. And so Fazel feels like he was supposed to get all of it because of Lawrence of Arabia's promise. And Fazel's brother, Abdullah, is beginning to organize a war against France. And Winston Churchill steps in and says, okay, guys, uh, France is sort of our ally. We're getting along together. We fought together against you know, the, the Germans. And, and so Winston Churchill pulls a fast one. And he takes the land that was given to the Jews, and he takes two-thirds of it away from the Jews, and he creates another brand new country out of the old Ottoman Empire called Jordan. And he makes Abdullah king of Jordan. So you have Al-Hashimi, Mecca, worked with Al, um, Lawrence of Arabia. Al-Hashimi's son Fazl is the king of this brand new country called Iraq. Al-Hashimi's other son Abdullah is now king of a brand new country called Jordan. But for his sake, Abdullah was a pretty nice guy. Here he is with Winston Churchill. Uh, here is what Abdullah writes about the Jews. No people on earth have been less anti-Semitic than the Arabs. The persecution of the Jews has been confined almost entirely to the Christian nations of the West, right? The Middle Ages, the Jews are killed, and the Nazis kill the Jews. Jews themselves will admit that never since the Great Dispersion, so he's acknowledging that the Jews were there and they were dispersed in 70 AD, did the Jews develop and reach such important as in Spain when it was an Arab possession. 700 years, the Muslims controlled Spain and the Jews had some freedom there. With very minor exceptions, Jews have lived for many centuries in the Middle East in complete peace and friendliness with their Arab neighbors. Right? So you have uh, Al Hashimi work with Lawrence of Arabia. His one son, Fazl, is the king of Iraq. He gets along with the Jews. Another son, Abdullah, king of Jordan, he gets along with the Jews. And, um, and so the Muslim world is becoming more westernized. You have Ataturk in Turkey. Instead of a sultan, you got this secular leader. And he says things, here he is with Fazl. So this is the head of Turkey, the head of Iraq, and they're dressed in business suits. They look like British guys. And here's Ataturk with the head of Iran, the Shah, and he wants to secularize Iran. And here's Ataturk with the king of Afghanistan. He wants to secularize Afghanistan, give women a right to vote, right? And let women get educated. And here's uh, Ataturk. He says, he is a weak ruler who needs religion to uphold his government. Uh, even before accepting the religion of the Arabs, the Turks were a great nation. Mohammedism was based on Arab nationalism above all nationalities. The purpose of the religion founded by Mohammed over all nations was to drag them into including Arab national politics. It might have suited tribes in the desert. It is no good for a modern progressive state. So the whole world in the Middle East was moving toward modern westernizing. And Kennedy honored Ataturk and and here's the Shah of Iran with Eisenhower, with Truman, with Kennedy. Um, here you have discos in, in Iran. Uh, here's, it looks like Berkeley, California, but that's Iran. Um, here's um, uh, at Kabul, Afghanistan. Girls with skirts on going to class at college. And here's beauty pageants in Syria. And um, here's Nasser in Egypt. And the women are wearing the latest fashions. And I mean, this looks like the Beach Boys. And, and this is Cairo, Egypt. And um, uh, what happened, here's Nasser, he said, uh, I met the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, made his request that um, wearing the hijab be mandatory, and he needed to demand every woman walk the street wear a tarha, and he, um, I told him my opinion, every person in his own house decides for himself the rules, and anyway, what happened, how did it change? Well, remember this guy, Al-Hashimi, son King Fazl, Iraq, King Abdullah, King Jordan, the British are trying to twist his arm to some treaty, and he waffles, and the British say, you know what, we're just going to let you get kicked out, and we're going to let the Saud family take over Arabia. Well, the Saud family was Wahhabi, and the Wahhabis were this violent, desert-wandering, chopping off arms and legs stuff. And Lawrence of Arabia wrote, the Wahhabis, followers of a fanatical Muslim heresy, had imposed their strict rules. Everything was forcibly pious, forcibly puritanical. Here's William McCants, Brookings Institute, 
Saudis promote a very toxic form of Islam that draws sharp lines between a small number of true believers and everyone else, Muslim and non-Muslim. So the Wahhabis are just as happy to kill a moderate Muslim as they are to kill an infidel. And why is this important? Because the Wahhabis get oil. So Standard Oil Company discovers oil in Saudi Arabia in 1938, and Saudi Arabia goes from the poorest Muslim country to the richest Muslim country, becomes a magnet for fundamentalism, for Wahhabism. And they use the money of us buying Saudi oil to spread Wahhabism. And Wahhabism spawned off every single terrorist group. So Muslim Brotherhood, PLO, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Boko Haram, all those groups are based on Wahhabi teaching out of the desert. And um, so Palestine used to be the land of the Jews. It was always that. Everybody knew that. Uh, FDR writes to the rabbi, Stephen Wise, United Palestine Appeal. And he talks about um, American people have watched with sympathetic interest the efforts of the Jews to renew in Palestine the ties of their ancient homeland. And um, so uh, the British waffle on the Jews. And 1922, British White Papers, Paul Newman was in the movie Exodus, but it's like the British are now stopping the Jews from going back. And uh, But uh, the Wahhabi teaching was really brought to a head with the Muslim Brotherhood started in 1928 six employees of the British-run Suez Canal Company, and the Muslim Brotherhood say, let's take this Wahhabi teaching and let's turn it into a strategy, a tactic. And it's based on the two cities Muhammad lived in. Muhammad was in Mecca, a religious Muslim. Muhammad was in Medina, a political and a military Muslim. And so the Muslim Brotherhood strategy is to infiltrate all these countries in the Middle East as a religious Muslim. And then when the signal is given, Boom, you become a political and militant Muslim and you assassinate people. You do terrorist attacks. But you have um, Truman. He's in World War I. And a buddy in the war is Eddie Jacobson, a Jew. They even run a PX together, right? And then after the war, Truman and Eddie Jacobson start a haberdashery, a men's clothing store in Kansas City. And then Truman becomes president. Now, the British, with their mandate, Right? And all the, the mess in the Middle East. Once the United Nations was formed with Harry S. Truman pushing it, the British said, this is our chance. We decide on May 15th, 1948, we are going to surrender our mandate to the United Nations. That's it. May 15th, 1948, we're done. And um, anyway, uh, that's when um, you have uh, Israel saying, okay, we want to be recognized as a nation because all these Arab nations are going to take us over. And uh, that's when uh, Eddie Jacobson makes a phone call to Harry S. Truman and said, Harry, Mr. President, um, say uh, a friend of mine, Chaim Wiseman, he's the president of Israel and he's in uh, Washington, D.C. And, and um, I know you're busy, but can you take a few minutes with him? And out of that friendship, Truman meets with Chaim Wiseman and likes him and realizes this is a providential opportunity and he recognizes Israel and he says the, the U.S. and since the U.S. founded the United Nations, the, the United Nations is going to recognize Israel as a nation May 15, 1948. It's immediately attacked by the Arabs. Then you have Abdullah, the, uh, the king of Jordan that was sort of nice to the Jews. He gets assassinated by those Muslim Brotherhood people. They snuck in, assassinated him. They tried to assassinate an Ataturk in Turkey. They tried to assassinate him, Gamal Nasser in Egypt. Then the, the, the Soviets, they come along, and uh, the, the PLO was started by the KGB. And it was part of this critical theory. So you, after World War II, you got a bunch of countries, and the idea is you go into these countries and destabilize them by identifying all the groups, putting them against each other, and then when they fight each other, victims and oppressors, then you can do a coup and replace the leader with a Soviet puppet. And all these countries are fallen. And so they created the PLO for one purpose, sow division in the Middle East. The PLO doesn't want peace. They want to sow division. That's their whole purpose. And so the KGB uh, worked with Castro in Cuba. And the KGB worked with um, Che Guevara and the FARC in Colombia and Bolivia. And, and they do this critical theory of breaking the people into groups. So now you see this melding together of the Wahhabi fundamentalist teachings, but it's sort of random, together with communist strategy of going in and breaking people into groups systematically. And so you got uh, Sa Saeed Kitab. He's a Muslim Brotherhood person, but now he understands he's Soviet tech. He does an assassination of plot on Nasser in Egypt, and he influenced Ayatollah, Al-Zawahiri, Al Osama bin Laden, all these different groups. 
We have a six-day war. Jews take back Jerusalem. And uh, Nixon meets with Golda Meir. She was born in Milwaukee. She's a Jewish woman that becomes prime minister of Israel. And she writes, there was no such thing as Palestinians. When was there an independent Palestinian people with a Palestinian state? We just went through all that history. Um, It was either southern Syria, part of the Ottoman Empire, before the First World War. And then it was Jordan, right? Winston Churchill created that country. It was not as though there were a Palestinian people and a Palestine considering itself a Palestinian people and we came along and, and threw them out and took their country from them. They did not exist. And so uh, the Muslim Brotherhood people assassinate Jews at the Munich uh, Olympics. They do the 1973 war. And then Egypt, Anwar Sadat, makes a treaty with the Jews, Menachem Begin. And both get the Nobel Peace Prize. Anwar Sadat, the head of Egypt, is honored by Billy Graham, honored by Pat Robertson. And everybody's saying, this is wonderful. We finally have the Arabs and Jews working together. But Anwar Sadat had the Muslim Brotherhood infiltrate the Egyptian military and they're having a parade and the soldiers stop, lower their rifles and kill Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt. And so um, then you have, so these secular leaders were on a fence. They wanted to become more westernized, but they're afraid of this Muslim brother assassinating them. Shah of Iran, loved America. I met his son. Uh, I actually went to school with Iranian students and they had an American flag on their dorm room wall. Um, so the Shah loved America, but Jimmy Carter betrayed the Shah and let the Ayatollah take over Iran. So whenever you see Iran firing missiles, Iran's doing this, Iran's... Thank Jimmy Carter. And so um, you have the Iran, Ayatollah found Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they blow up the U.S. Marine barracks in Lebanon. And then... We always think of checkers, two sides, it's always more than two. It's like a Chinese checkers, there's multiple sides. And so the the U.S. does not like the Soviet Union, and there's a group in Afghanistan called the Taliban, and so the U.S. arms and trains the Taliban to fight the Soviets, called the Soviet-Afghan Wars, Operation Cyclone. It's the largest CIA covert operation. We're arming and training the Taliban! And it was so big that Tom Hanks did a movie on it, Charlie Wilson's War, Sylvester Stallone did a movie on it, Rambo 3, and, um, and then the Iran-Iraq war. And we don't want the Ayatollah to win, so we are arming and training Saddam Hussein. Rumsfeld, Reagan, and, um, and then we have a president that wants a new world order and sort of switches it. Bill Clinton, Operation Deliberate Force, was funneling weapons through Iran to the Bosnian Muslims to kill the Serbian Christians. And um, uh, then we come up closer to the present. And uh, during Obama, Here's a Los Angeles Times article. In Syria, militias armed by the Pentagon fight those armed by the CIA, right? So we're arming both sides. Uh, Hillary Clinton doing gun running from Benghazi to Syria. Tulsi Gabbard even introduced a bill called Stop Arming Terrorist Act. (laughs) It's like, hello, if we could just stop arming the bad guys, it could get peaceful. Trump ends covert plan to arm Syrian rebels. and, And then Biden abandons Afghanistan to the Taliban. It's like we armed and trained them. There's no way they could take us by surprise. And he leaves $85 billion worth of weapons, and here's the article. U.S. weapons from Afghanistan ended up in the Palestinian groups operated in the Gaza Strip, and they're being shot at the Jews. And then we have a reminder, the Biden administration granted Iran billions in new sanction relief just months ago. Wall Street Journal, Biden keeps the billions flowing to Iran. So Iran is firing missiles at Israel, with U.S. money paying for it all. And then they're infiltrating South America into the drug gangs and coming up. They now have Hezbollah chapters in Venezuela and they're coming across the southern borders and our administration is busing them to cities all around America. And there's a concern that, gee, are they going to do that that Muslim Brotherhood thing where they're going to pretend like they're nice and then when the signal's given, do a terrorist attack. And here's little Israel, 9 million people, surrounded by 400 million Muslims, Agreed, majority of Muslims just want to live their lives, but the fundamental ones are threatening them. And if we show weakness, then they're going to end up getting those to cave. Now, the founder of Hamas, 1985, had a son. He's still alive. His name is Mossab Hassan Yusuf. I met him. I interviewed him on a radio program. 
And he grew up in Palestine. And he saw the Palestinians, the Gaza, the Hamas, were torturing his friends because they thought his friends were working with the Jews. And he says, I knew them. They weren't working with the Jews. And he watched them get tortured to death. And he says, if Hamas is doing this and they're not in charge of everything, imagine if they do get in charge. So from 1997 to 2027, Yusav was secretly helping the Jews, warning them of terrorist attacks. And eventually he became a Christian, escaped to America. And he did a CBN interview, 2010. My problem with the God of the Quran, if we compare his personality to the God of the Bible, we will find the difference. From their fruits, you shall know them. The fruits of the God of the Quran is terrorism, beating women, killing children. My transformation took six years of study. It did not, was not overnight. I had to study Christianity and other religions. I considered at some point not to believe in any religion. The only path I found, peace which was good for me and good for all mankind, was Jesus Christ. Now, I want to close with a little bit of the gospel, Jesus Christ. So, have you ever sinned against anybody? You sort of don't want to be around the person you've sinned against. Let's say you're talking about somebody behind their back, you're joking, making fun of them, and you look up and there they are, and they're walking toward you. Question, are you drawn to want to go over to that person? No, you're embarrassed. Your own conscience wants to make you get away from them. So when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they wanted to get away from God. It was like two magnets that are stuck together, and one of them turns. The first one wants to touch, but the second one wants to get away. So it's not so much that God wants to send people to hell. It's once people sin against God, it's their own conscience that makes them want to stay away from God. So Adam and Eve said, we blew it. We have to do something to make ourselves acceptable to God. They put on fig leaves. That was the beginning of false religions. Man coming up with man's idea how to make man acceptable to God. Did the fig leaves make Adam and Eve acceptable to God? No. And you read this little line, God made Adam and Eve coats of skins. Question, how do you make a coat of skin? Kill an animal. You think God went to the other side of the garden, killed an animal, and brought Adam and Eve some nice tailored outfits? Or do you think maybe he killed the animal right in front of them? And they witnessed the first death ever. Right? Creation just happened. This would have been the first thing ever to die. And Adam and Eve are watching this innocent animal go through the pangs of dying. And they're thinking to themselves, we're the ones that sin, but this innocent animal is the one that's dying. And God wanted to make it really clear to them that this animal was dying in their place. That right in front of them, he strips the skin off the animal and he puts it on their naked bodies. Maybe it still had a little blood on it, right? They're covered in the blood. And so for the rest of their lives, Adam and Eve are wearing the skin of the animal that they watch die in their place. And whenever God sees Adam and Eve, he sees them clothed with the skin of the animal, the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So Adam and Eve tell Cain and Abel. Cain decides he wants to worship God, but he does an offshoot of the church of the fig leaf. He starts the church of the fruits and the nuts. Cain's was a religion of works. And we know it's works because God told Adam, the ground is cursed for your sake and you will bring forth fruit by the sweat of your brow. Sweat is work. Cain's bringing forth fruit out of the ground. He's sweating. He's, He's trying to work his way to heaven. Did Cain's works make him acceptable to God? No. If you do works, you can be proud of your work. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Abel trusted in the lamb. And it's this picture God is on one side, we are on the other side, our sins separate us from God, the lamb pays for the sin. The lamb gets judged instead of us. So Noah offered lambs when he got off the ark. Abraham offered lambs. Moses had every family in Israel kill a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost of their house so the angel of death that's bringing judgment passes over because it says, here's the blood, the judgment's already been paid for this house, and it passes over. The high priest brings the blood of the lamb into the Holy of Holies. You got the tent, the holy place, the Holy of Holies, and inside is the Ark of the Covenant, a gold box, two angels on top with the presence of the Lord, and inside the box is the Ten Commandments. And you got the Lord's the presence of the Lord, looking down at the Ten Commandments, and the high priest comes in, and he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat, the lid, between the presence of the Lord and the law, saying, this lamb, we broke the law, but this lamb took the judgment in our place. If the high priest would have approached without the blood, 
he would have been approaching the judgment seat. The, the blood changed it from a judgment seat into a mercy seat. Solomon had a thousand lambs killed when he dedicated the temple. Finally, John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So God is on one side. We are on the other side. Our sins separate us from God. The Lamb pays for the sin. So I ask people, are you approaching God as Cain or as Abel? If you're still hoping you're good enough to go to heaven, you are approaching God as Cain. I hope I piled enough good works on the altar. Maybe a couple more handfuls of barley. That'll be enough. Or are you approaching God as Abel? It's not me being good enough as this lamb that was good enough to take all the judgment I deserve upon itself. God is just. He has to judge every sin. If God does not judge a sin, by default, his silence would be giving consent to the sin. Like in a wedding ceremony, if you're silent, you're giving consent to the wedding. If God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. And he cannot deny himself. So he has to judge every sin. But he's love and that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac going to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages, it was a hidden plan. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus, the Son of God, became man, took the judgment for all of our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? The Lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's His plan. He came up with it. He can love you for the rest of eternity. You can love Him back for the rest of eternity and not have to worry about being judged by Him because all the judgment you deserve went on Christ and you're approaching God through Christ. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. I'll end with that. God bless you.